There we go. Cool. I didn't really want sound for that one anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate that. Everybody give Josh a hand for uh, the circus music for the intro today. You know what? I think that our intro music today, I think it just needed a little bit of uh, rest. <laughs> there we go. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, we are glad uh, that you are here today. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching online, sorry that you didn't hear anything. We didn't either. Um, so uh, we're glad that wherever you're watching, however you're watching, however you're worshiping with us today, I am so thrilled that you are here today. Um, this morning, we're actually going to conclude this series that we've been in on this idea of Sabbath and, and, and even how we find some of this uh, every day. Um, and we, we've been in this for three weeks and we've been exploring it in, in, in kind of the, the depths of it. It's worked through the Old Testament into the New Testament into kind of this new model that Jesus uh, presented for us. And so we want to talk a little bit more today. And so I want to, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrew cha Hebrews chapter three. But here's what I want to do today. I want to take us through a, a text. It's actually a little bit of a lengthy text and it's pretty complicated. And so there's going to be a lot of scripture. There's going to be a lot of cross references. We'll be going back to the Old Testament and then connecting cross references to cross references. So all that being said, if you have not downloaded the notes, I would highly recommend it. There may even be an Easter egg in there for some comedy today uh, if you do it. So if you haven't, you can text the word LH notes to 833-641-0175 um, in, in, or you can get the bulletin. The notes are through the bulletin also, but we got a lot to cover today. Um, and so stick with me. My sermon timer on my iPad always says 35 minutes when I start. My goal is to not go more than five minutes over that today. <laughs> so uh, Hebrews chapter three, we're going to jump in there uh, here in just a second. Uh, before we do, this passage is going to have a comparison for us. And I, and I want to give you a, a, a kind of tangible example of this before we jump into it. And this is how I would love to explain this to you. I have a condition called hyperfixation when it comes to my hobbies. This is what that means. I have seasons where I will like obsess about one thing. Like, and I'll hear something go, well, that sounds cool. I think I want to do that. Like, you know, photography is a great example of this. And I'll start out and I'll have like the bare minimum I need to get started in this concept. And then before long, I get really obsessed to the point where I need to buy more expensive gear for this or more expensive products because this is like the hobby that really fulfills me until I hear about the next hobby. I've got a collection of hobby things at my house because it wasn't just photography. Then it turned into like astral photography and I had to figure out how do I take pictures at night? What about when it's foggy outside? And I needed all the equipment that, to make that possible. Currently, I I'm obsessed with, with Turkish coffee, thanks to someone in our church who will remain nameless. And I've realized that the grinder I have for grinding coffee beans is not good enough. But the one I really need is only $80 for the hand manual grinder. They will only grind coffee for that specific type of coffee. But like I don't, I, I feel like I really need it. Right, and, and until I, I realize, so, so when I start these hobbies, I, I have what I think is enough until I realize that there's something better. Now that's a silly example, but, there's a, but, but I, I share that with you because I want to look at this in terms of the covenants of God that we see from the Old Testament to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews chapter 3, it's going to give us this analogy, and this is what I need you to understand before we jump into it, is that in the Old Testament, God had, there was actually a few, but, but one of the main covenants, the word covenant means promise, one of the main promises that God made with his people was through Moses. Right, Moses went to Egypt. Right, we saw everybody seen the Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt. Right, we all know this. Moses went to Egypt. He grew up in Pharaoh's household, but he was Jewish. Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. Moses left because of a, a, a fight that he got in. It's a little more complicated than that. Then he came back because God said, "Hey, I want you to go free my people from Egypt." After he did, they go into the wilderness, and God gives him this covenant. The Mosaic Covenant, it's, it's the sacrificial system. It's, it's a way that God's people could be in relationship with God before Jesus came onto the scene, right? Then Jesus came and completed that covenant and fulfilled it in a whole new way, okay? Everyone tracking so far? 
All right, let's jump into the text, Hebrew chapter three, starting in verse one. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, right? Brothers, sisters, fellow believers, right? We all consider Jesus as the completer of our faith. He is the high priest. He's the one who's completed our covenant promise, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builders of the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God, right? So he's saying Jesus is greater here in this sense than Moses. And he's using this analogy of this house. And keep in mind, he's writing this to the Hebrew people, Hebrews. That's where the book gets its name from. And he's telling them this covenant that you've lived in your whole life, that your ancestors lived in for generations, for thousands of years, right? It's not that it was bad, but Jesus came to add something that is better. Right now, Moses, who was faithful in all of God's houses as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is what he's saying. The, Mo the Mosaic covenant was a worship system given to Moses. It was good but it was always intended to be temporary. The new covenant established by Jesus is complete and it is greater or better than the Moses, than Moses's covenant. It completes it, right? So, so here's where starting off and you're like, what does this have to do with Sabbath and rest? You're going to have to bear with me, right? So starting off, we know this, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is telling the Hebrew people, Hey, this old worship system that we lived in was good, but it was temporary. But what Jesus brought us is more complete when we are united in faith to him. Okay. Tracking so far. All right. Verse seven, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and if you're reading this in your Bible, some of this next portion will be in poetry form. It's actually a song. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with a generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Everything makes sense now? Clears mud, everybody? We're good then, right? All right, let's look at this passage because it is, it's a song that's in the middle. Really what we're reading here is a sermon in Hebrew. So the Hebrew writer is using passages from the Old Testament in a sermon format to get his point across. And so in this, what he's saying is he's actually quoting almost directly from Psalm 95, which was written by David, King David, David, Goliath, David, that David, right? Psalm 95 was written by David and David, and so he's quoting this very specific passage, but this passage is actually quoting several other passages from the New Testament. So in quoting this, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 95. He's talking, he's referencing Psalm or Numbers 12 through 14, Numbers 20, and Deuteronomy 12, right? We'll read Deuteronomy 12, but I'm going to paraphrase the Numbers passages if we're okay with that. Because again, like at some point we got to have to get out of here today. So in Psalm 95, it's this poem that references these two specific instances that happened to the people, the Hebrew people after they came out of slavery. And in this song, you know, and, and look at the end of this, this passage in, in Hebrews, right? It's, it references, they have not, they have not known my ways as I sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's pretty, that's pretty bold, right? So David's writing this, quoting God and quoting at this point, Deuteronomy 12, but there's a, there's a specific situation that he's quoting because to invoke the wrath of God, the Hebrew people did some pretty terrible things. 
And we see those in Numbers 12 through 14 and Numbers 20, right? Numbers 12 through 14, this is, the Hebrew people, are, are, they're, they're actually brought out of slavery from Egypt, and they've given this land, we call it the promised land, it's literally a land that was promised to them when God saved them uh, and, and brought them out of captivity and was going to bring them to this land of promise, this, this fertile land that we know is Israel, or modern day Israel, or kind of Israel in some of the surrounding areas, and so the Hebrew people sent out 12 spies to investigate the land that God had promised them. But here's the thing, the spies, 10 of them came back and were afraid and terrified. Two of them were like, giddy up, let's go. But 10 of them were like, we can't do this. The enemies are too great. They'll destroy us. And what happened was then the people, the Hebrew people as a nation became afraid and they refused to go. And so they chose to disobey God. And in response, he cursed them to wander the wilderness for 40 years. So when the passage talks about the, the 40 years, they're cursed, right? That's the wrath of God is they could not enter the land of promise for 40 years. And so the generation that came out of Egypt had all died and their children were those who were entering the promised land, right? That's the curse. There's a second one reference in this passage is Numbers chapter 20. There's a few chapters later, after they've been cursed to wander for 40 years, they get into this place where they're really thirsty. They don't have water. And the Hebrew people are out in the wilderness. They have no water and begin to quarrel. And God gives some pretty specific instructions to Moses. But out of Moses' frustration, he disobeys God. He acts rebelliously like the people did. And so God told him and his brother Aaron, actually, that they would not lead the people into the promised land. Right, so Psalm 95 references these two specific things, but then it says that the, that the result, is that the sins of the Hebrew people, because of their sin, they, they couldn't walk into this land of promise. But the, what Psalm 95 says is, you cannot walk into my rest, is what God says. The other passage we see here is Deuteronomy 12, and it kind of gives some context about what he means by you can't walk into my rest because he's, he's, there's a reference to the land, but there's something more to this, right? And, and the sin of the people brought on the wrath of God, and then because of their rebellion, they're withheld what God says is, is his rest. Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 12. If you have your actual Bible, Deuteronomy is the place that's like the really gold section of your Bible. We don't have a ton of sermons out of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse, starting verse 8 says this, You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today. Everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. So what he's saying is, you're in the wilderness right now, and everyone's just doing what they think is right. But there's going to come a day where you don't do that. For you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. All right, there it is again. It's a direct reference here that we're seeing in both Psalm 95 and Hebrews chapter 3. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, right? So when you finally get to the place where you can walk into the promised land, when that happens, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Okay, so the sin of the Hebrew people in the wilderness, the sins were disobedience and infighting. It brought on the wrath. The result is God withheld his rest but in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in, in, in uh, Hebrews 3 and Psalm 95, he says that the punishment for rebellion is you shall not enter my rest. But what Deuteronomy tells us that when God refers to the temple, right? That's what we're seeing this as, right? My rest is in the land of promise. And then he goes on to, ex to describe the temple. It's a place of worship. It's a place of burnt offering. It's a place of vows. He is describing what the temple will be. The temple is also the place where the spirit of God dwells. 
So in Deuteronomy, God refers to the temple, which will be the place of worship for the Jewish people and the place where the spirit of God resides. So here's the point of all of this, right? I know it's a lot. We've been a lot like you still with me. You track it. If not, again, get the notes, right? So the Hebrew writer talking about rest is talking about worship also. And the result of the sins of the Hebrew people was that in, in, in the wilderness, God took away their ability to fully worship and to find rest. We know that Sabbath is physical, but also spiritual renewal. And so they were limited in the amount of spiritual renewal they could receive. Their worship was impacted because they were rebellious. Their relationship with God was impacted because they chose to fight with one another. The Hebrews author continues, says, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell, who died in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were all unable to enter because of unbelief. They didn't fully rest because they didn't fully put their faith in God. You see, when the people of Israel rebelled against God, they limited their ability to find rest because they weren't capable of fully worshiping. Their unbelief limited their spiritual renewal. Here's the thing this should show us. One, if we have friends who are unbelievers, they're not going to fully be able to find spiritual renewal. There's another, yet another reason why we need to be sharing our faith with people. But also, this was the people of God that rebelled, that through their unbelief, it limited their worship and it limited their ability to be poured into by God. And so the result is that the people could get up to the promised land, but they never were actually able to enter the promised land. And while they didn't fully turn away from God, they... They also never fully rested because there's a generation that died in the wilderness because of their disobedience and rebellion, because of their infighting. And Moses died overlooking the promised land. How would you like to be on the edge of the greatness, of the fullness that God had for you, but miss out and only be able to see it and not really experience it? The analogy, that the best analogy I can think of is it's like go, uh, spending all this time and energy to go to a stadium where your favorite sports team is playing or, or maybe a concert where your favorite artist is performing. But instead of going into the stadium, you sit in your car and you just listen to it on the radio. You're that close, but all you can do is experience just a little bit of it. You don't get the full experience. That's what the people of Israel were struggling with, right? They could see the promised land. They just weren't able to go into it. They, could, they recognized God was good. He was feeding them every day. He gave them manna. He gave them food. He led them. Cloud by day, fire by night. They couldn't ignore God's presence, but they didn't fully get to experience it because of their rebellious hearts. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Just stick with me. Let's keep on going into chapter four, verse one. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. 
For we who have believed enter that rest, right? Believers enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Keep in mind that, that Moses had this covenant system that was good, but Jesus made a better, more complete system. And so while there were limitations for the people under Moses' covenant to enter in God's rest, as believers, we have access to the fullness of who God is. Scripture says that we have access to the mind of Christ. We get to experience the fullness of God, including his rest. But here's the, also the warning in this. The writer of Hebrews says that we also should not fight. Because it was that rebelliousness, it was the infighting among the people of the Hebrew people that, that limited their ability to find that true rest. And so we're warned not to fight, except here's one problem with that. Christians love to fight. We just love to point fingers at each other. I don't know if you've ever been part of a church that, that has gone through an ugly split or if you've ever had a situation where, where you, you've seen uh, churches fight over members for attendance on a Sunday morning. Like, I don't know if you've, you've been in, in any of those situations, but here's the thing that, that growing up in the church, being educated in the church, and then leading churches that I know, is that Christians don't always like people just because they're Christians. We look for lots of reasons not to like people. I want to share with you three reasons. And if you have the notes, there's a link there to 25 silly things church members fight over. These are my three of my favorites off of that list. You can read the whole list for yourself after the <laughs> service. One person said that their church, there was an argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. Yeah. That's why Josh has had to have pretty short stubble. You can't, you can't outgrow the length of mine. Like that's, that's just a competition and I've got to win that one. <laughs> Number two is a fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. <laughs> but I mean, when you think about it, people really were just dying to get in. <laughs> oh, doo -doo <laughs> God, there's a lot of like, <laughs> that one was hurtful. Like, oh. For those of you watching online, I'm sure you appreciated that joke more than the people in the room. <laughs> Number three, arguments over what type of green beans the church should serve. And wait, I know you're going to think this is silly for a second, but listen, this is important. And different classes of green bean go for different dishes, especially at the potluck. Like if you have green bean casserole and you don't put French crust green beans in it, you better just go home. You think I'm joking. If there's bacon... I mean, if there's fresh green beans that are not wrapped in bacon and grilled, like, why are you even showing up to the game? This is important stuff, guys. No wonder people are fighting over this. Christians love to fight. But when we fight, we miss an opportunity to find true spiritual renewal in worship. This is what that means. Disunity and fighting is a roadblock to worship, and it's a roadblock to Sabbath rest. And here's the thing, we can joke all day, but there's some real reasons why people have fought. Whether it be politics, mask mandates, land purchases, hiring certain people, firing certain people, or just in general, the things that we as humans quarrel over. There's a lot of fighting but there's a reason I think that what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, he says that if you're at the altar to give your gift and you re remember that your brother has a grievance against you, against you, you stop your worship and you go and make it right and then come back to worship. Because when we see with disunity, what we see with fighting is it stops our ability to fully worship and it hinders us from having that spiritual renewal. We essentially put ourselves in the same place that people of Israel did in the wilderness and we don't truly experience God's rest that he would have for us in the spiritual renewal that we receive through worship. I 
The passage continues in verse four. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. <laughs> what he's saying is, if you hear this, that today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, like that's a reminder to leave the rebelliousness, to leave the disunity, to leave the infighting, to leave the disobedience. Don't let your heart be hardened by your sin or your fight. Let it be open to God. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Right? So Joshua, the leader after Moses, who actually led the people into the promised land. What, what he's saying is Joshua didn't have to give them rest because when they entered the promised land, they were then able to find that rest. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. I know it's, it's complicated stuff, but, I, but hear me, I think this is so important. And I think this is really where we need to finish this series because as we who are humans who are overwhelmingly busy and chronically unsatisfied, our lives cry out that demands our rest, both physical and spiritual. And while we can take a day off, the only way to find true spiritual renewal is through God, is through worshiping him and engaging and having that relationship with him. But it's not easy because our sin keeps us from that. Fighting amongst each other keeps us from that. We have to work hard to be in a place where we experience the fullness of God in our worship. You know what's easy? Just walking in every Sunday. Singing the song, sitting through the sermons. We may even take a couple notes or make a comment about it. Right? It's easy just to walk into the room. You know what's hard? Really engaging that we can experience life transformation as a congregation every single Sunday. You know what's hard is to take that same spirit to your personal time with God every single day and the relationships you have with one another. Guys, it's easy to come in church and be the church, but it's not easy to actually be the church. It's hard. We have to strive for that. And sometimes we skip church. You know why? Because, you know, we had a really busy weekend. We had a lot going on. Strive for your worship. Strive for spiritual renewal. Don't let your sin or infighting or apathy be the thing that keeps you from achieving that. We have to work hard to be in a place where we experience the fullness of God in worship. And it's not about raising your hands or getting on your knees. It's about the condition of your heart and its relationship to the creator of the universe and the acceptance of Jesus who died for you died for you so that you could experience fullness of worship and find rest in that. And it sounds counterintuitive that we have to work to find rest. But when we experience those moments, there's a level of renewal that I can't express. The most significant moments in my life with God are things that I desire or times that I desire over and over and over again because of how good and how sweet and how spiritually renewing they are. And we're supposed to enter that every single week. I want to go back look at this passage, chapter 12, really quickly. It's in chapter, I'm sorry, chapter three, 12, 
12, chapter three, really quickly. We read over this, but I want to look at it again because I think that the writer of Hebrews actually gave us a solution in the middle of his sermon, not at the end. So I want to look at verses 12 through 14 again, because this is what it says. All right. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As believers in Jesus, we are united under Jesus. The unity we share in Jesus gives us accountability with one another, right? That's one of the beauties of being part of a community of faith is that we share faith in Jesus. And so we know that we can hold each other to that level of confidence and faith in Jesus. And we can have other men and women in our lives that keep us accountable to that. Because the truth is we all need others in our lives that help us follow Jesus better. Every single one of us needs that. And here's the point, right? This is, this is the landing that I, I really need you to grasp today is that in unity, in unity, we should work together every day to follow God and to experience true spiritual renewal in worshiping him. Here's my question. Who is making sure that you are following God to the fullest extent that you can? Who is making sure that if there's sin in your life, you're making it right? Who is making sure that if you're fighting with someone, they're going to call you out on it? Who is making sure that you spend your time of Sabbath and get that spiritual renewal that we all need, that we're created to need. One of my best friends in the entire world, his name is Jeffrey Turner. He's preached here for us a couple times. He's a pastor in Texas. And I talk to him pretty frequently and, and often when I'm talking to him on the phone, he's like, hey, what, what, what'd you do this week? And I was like, as I did this and this and this and this and this. He goes, like, did you work every day? Like, when are you going to take your Sabbath time? Like, when are you going to take your rest time? Well, when are you going to take yours? Right? <laughs> I mean, he's the guy that if I have back-to-back -back weeks where I've got these seasons that are just overwhelming and I don't get my days off and I just fill my calendar with thing after thing after thing, he's the one that makes sure that I get that time. We talked about this last week, whether it's those, those moments every day or, or it's those breakaway times for real renewal and solitude and spiritual reflection, right? He's the guy that checks on me. Who's the guy that checks on you? Who have you asked to be that for you in your life? Maybe it's your spouse. But here's the thing. If your spouse is the one that makes sure that, that you're not disobeying God and you're walking in the fullness of spiritual renewal, you can't get mad at them when they say you need to take a break. And you can't say the phrase, well, you just don't understand. Well, I understand what Pastor Joel said that Sunday. Who is the person? And I love the concept of what, what Jesus, or what the writer of Hebrews shows us here, is that what Jesus fulfilled for us is this system of worship that we get true spiritual renewal. We get the rest that was denied those who died in the wilderness through Jesus, but also through the unity that we have under Jesus. Spiritual Christian unity is so vital. We have to have it. And if we're experiencing infighting with other believers, and if we're choosing to live in sin and disobeying God, we will not find the spiritual rest that we were designed to need. So who is your person? Or into people, who are your people? that ensure that who's the person that like it says, right? Look at this again, man, that passage is way back there. <laughs> there we go. Who's your person that's going that can exhort you every day 
as long as it is called today, that you won't harden your heart or be, de- be deceived by sin. Other question, who can you do that for? Who is somebody else that you can provide that for? Because here's what I know. I don't want to be like the people in the wilderness who died there not experiencing the fullness of rest that God had in his temple and his worship. I want to experience more because I think God has more for us. The section of scripture ends with a verse that I think is quoted out of context often, but I want to read it for you today. Verse 11 says, therefore let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. In verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We often quote this verse and use it just to talk about the Bible, but in the context here, he's referring to, to the passages of scripture he just used to point out that we need rest, that we need spiritual renewal and we need to follow God and be in unity together. But the word of God is living and active. It draws us into that. It grows in us and draws us to God that that wants us to have that full spiritual renewal. That's how you were designed to be. It's how I was designed to be. Every week, we need that day set aside for physical and spiritual renewal. And it's not for the sake of legalism, but it's because Sabbath was made for us. And then when we enter those seasons where it gets so overwhelming and the enemy seems to be taking that time away or or good reasons to not take our day, show up. We need to look for small moments every single day to find moments of physical and spiritual renewal. And ultimately, we've got to find people in our lives that can hold us to this standard of faith so we can find that true, true spiritual renewal through Sabbath that God gives us. That we were created to experience. Here's the thing. I don't know if I want to try to do life without that. It just doesn't seem worth it. When all we need to do is is be in right relationship and put our faith in God and trust him and find others that will help us walk into that. And we can experience those best spiritual renewal moments every single week. But it does take work. And if you don't have those people, here's my challenge. Don't let another week go by where you don't find them. The people who can ask you, the people who can make sure that you walk into that. That may be an awkward conversation. Let me give you a tip with how to start it. Hey, did you know that some churches fight about what type of green beans there are? (laughs) But what I really need is to make sure that I don't get caught up in petty fighting. Because when I do that, it keeps me from experiencing the true worship and true renewal that God has for me. Can you just help me make sure that I don't get bitter, that I'm not walking in sin and that I really am pursuing worship and rest? And if you can't remember that, we record these and put them on YouTube every week. (laughs) It's worth it, I promise. And it's worth it to be renewed physically and spiritually because what God has for us is something that is so much greater than we could ever accomplish on our own. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the men and women in this room. God, I pray you put on our hearts that we can walk and we can live in physical and spiritual renewal every single week. Lord, I pray that we walk in unity and unlike the people in the wilderness, Lord, that the rebellion doesn't overwhelm us and cause us to miss the rest that you would have for us. 
So I pray that for each and every one of us this week, you put it on our hearts to find that person, to ask that person, have the conversation that in Christian unity, someone can help hold us to the rest and spiritual renewal that we need. We thank you. We ask your blessing over our church. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.